Let me uh, say a couple of things before we begin. First, uh, I, I do want to acknowledge, which I should have acknowledged before, that um, we have two co-sponsors uh, for our conference uh, today. One is our longtime institutional strategic partner, uh, Baylor University. Uh, and I'm delighted that uh, Tom Hibbs, Dean of the Baylor Honors College and head of the Baylor and Washington program is here today. I'm also delighted that uh, Baylor President Emeritus, Judge Ken Starr, is, is here with us today. And, and Judge Starr, I should add, is also a contributor uh, to the Christianity and Freedom volumes. He contributed a chapter on uh, the development uh, of and Christian contributions to uh, religious freedom in the United States. Uh, uh, and let me also say that another one of our institutional partners uh, has been the Witherspoon Institute uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, represented here by uh, Matthew Frank, uh, who uh, marvelously participated in the first panel uh, you heard. So uh, thanks to the Witherspoon Institute uh, for being a part of this project from the very beginning, uh, including uh, its support of this conference. So thank you uh, very, very much. I'm delighted uh, to have uh, now uh, just an extraordinary set of scholars uh, to continue our conversation about, uh, as we already discussed, uh, the, the ancient uh, roots uh, of ideas of conscience, uh, freedom, uh, and uh, dignity, uh, how those roots were articulated, developed, uh, the impact that they had historically going back to the very uh, earliest uh, stages of Christianity. Uh, and we're going to talk about the impact uh, of these ideas across uh, history. Uh, we're going to cover something like uh, 2,000 years, I think, in the course of our panel. Uh, now we had, of course, a very focused discussion earlier today about the Reformation and uh, what the Reformation did or didn't mean, roots of certain Reformation ideas of conscience in ancient uh, patristic uh, writings, also in scripture. Uh, today, or now, we're going to spend a little more time uh, talking about the ancient uh, roots uh, of uh, notions of uh, individual freedom, conscience, uh, dignity, and how, as it were, long before Martin Luther's Here I Stand, or long before Caritas uh, Pirkheimer's Here I Stand, we had other extraordinary Christian individuals say, in effect, Here I Stand. Uh, we'll be talking about Gregory of Nyssa, uh, who said, Here I Stand uh, in uh, the fourth century, against slavery. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, Basil of Caesarea uh, and his great Here I Stand against poverty uh, and hunger uh, around the same period in the fourth century. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, Bartolome de las Casas, uh, the Dominican, uh, who said Here I Stand against the enslavement uh, and genocide of Amerindian peoples in the New World. And we'll be talking about other great figures in Christian history who in effect said Here I Stand on the ground of conscience, the sacred ground of conscience, uh, for the truth about the dignity and the freedom of all human beings. Uh, this is an intimidatingly impressive panel. Um, I, have, I, I have something like two single-spaced pages of, uh, of their biographies. Uh, I'm not going to read all their biographies, which would just take time away from our conversation. I, I refer you to the, uh, the booklet uh, that you all should have, uh, and the booklet will contain uh, biographies uh, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the speakers, or at least I think there's another publication that has the biographies. Am I, am I mistaken about that? Uh, yeah, there, yes, there, there are biographies in the, in the, in the publication. I'll refer the, uh, you to the publication, which also has short essays by some of those who are with us uh, today, some of those who contributed to the Christianity and Freedom uh, volumes. Uh, there's a summary of Robert Wilkins' lecture. Uh, David Lantigua has a summary of his uh, essay. Uh, so I refer you to the publication. I also refer you to the Berkeley Center blog uh, called the Berkeley Forum, uh, which has more essays by other contributors uh, to today's conference. So if you're eager to carry on the conversation, please uh, do go to the blog, uh, pick up the publication. And again, I refer you to the publication for the, the bios. Uh, but I also want to refer you to the, uh, the, the books piled up in the back there, uh, remind you about the opportunity for a papal indulgence. Uh, you know, you, the, 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 lunch was, the lunch was free. That was in part to make you feel guilty so that you'd you know, want to buy the books. So please do, please do buy the books. Uh, but um, I am delighted that we have with us, uh, again, four extraordinary scholars. To my immediate left is Kyle Harper, uh, who is Senior Vice President and Provost at the University of Oklahoma. 
as was already mentioned uh, earlier, uh, he is author of uh, Slavery in the Late Roman World, uh, published in 2011. Uh, which was awarded the James Henry Breasted Prize by the American Historical Association and the Outstanding Publication Award from the Classical Association of the Middle West and South. His second book, uh, a groundbreaking book that deservedly uh, earned a lot of discussion, uh, was From Shame to Sin, The Christian Transformation of Sexual Morality. Uh, and uh, depressingly, uh, he has a brand new book, uh, which uh, uh, is also getting ex extraordinary attention. Uh, that's three books in about seven years. Uh, brand new book uh, called The Fate of Rome, Climate, Disease, and the End of an Empire, which was just reviewed in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Kyle Harper is among uh, the stars uh, in uh, the historical study of late antiquity, including uh, the early uh, origins of Christianity. Uh, so we're delighted to have Kyle Harper with us. Uh, also delighted that my friend Elizabeth Pradramu uh, is here. She is an outstanding scholar of religion and international relations, uh, including uh, the, the role of uh, the Orthodox Church uh, in the world historically and in the present day. Uh, she is visiting associate professor of conflict resolution at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. Uh, she's also a non-resident senior fellow in national security and international policy at the Center for American Progress. Uh, she is co-editor and contributor uh, to uh, the volume Eastern Orthodox Christianity and American Higher Education and Thinking Through Faith, New Perspectives from Orthodox Christian Scholars. Uh, and then uh, to Elizabeth's left, uh, we have David Lantigua, uh, formerly of Catholic University, now Assistant Professor of Moral Theology and Christian Ethics at the University of Notre Dame. David specializes in late scholastic moral and political thought emerging out of the Salamanca Spanish School and the debates concerning the Spanish conquest of the Americas. We had some discussion about that already and we'll have further discussion uh, thanks to David. Uh, his research explores the contested legacy of Latin and Lat Latino Christianity and current discussions of just war, empire, race, religious violence, international order, and human rights. Uh, he is um, uh, working on uh, a couple of major uh, book projects, uh, and uh, we'll hopefully hear more about that uh, in due course. Uh, and then finally, uh, last but not least, uh, we have Slavica Jakelic, uh, who is Associate Professor of Humanities and Social Thought at Christ College at Valparaiso University. Her scholarly interests and publications center on religion and collective identity religious and secular humanisms, theories of religion and secularism, theories of modernity, uh, and of conflict resolution. Before joining Christ College at Valparaiso, uh, Jakelic has worked at or been a fellow of a number of interdisciplinary institutes in Europe and the US, including the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture at the University of Virginia, uh, where she worked for many years alongside the, the, the notable sociologist James Davison Hunter on a variety of projects and uh, issues at the intersection of religion and its role uh, in modern society. Uh, she is the author of Collectivistic, Collectivistic Religions, Religion, Choice, and Identity in Late Modernity, and is currently working on another book, The Practice of Religious and Secular Humanisms. So uh, I, I want us uh, to proceed in much the way that Tom Farr proceeded with his panel. Namely, we're going to have a conversation. This is not a series of speeches. Uh, I, I did uh, provide questions to our uh, distinguished panelists ahead of time. Uh, and I will pose these questions, and they'll offer some uh, preliminary remarks. And then we'll have a conversation with each other, uh, but then uh, very soon with you all, uh, with at least 30 minutes of opportunity to uh, interact uh, with, with you. And I'd like to be begin by asking a question that I'm going to pose to uh, uh, really all of the panelists, particularly Kyle and Elizabeth uh, and David. And it's a question that revisits the discussion we've already had uh, about uh, the uh, genealogy, as it were, the, the origins of uh, individualism. We had a great deal of discussion about that earlier. And we, we of course, are familiar uh, with uh, the, the, the fact that at the heart of Western modernity is a powerful moral and indeed spiritual vision, one that casts human beings as free and equal individuals of inestimable worth and dignity. And we're familiar, I think, with the, the fact that this vision also tends to cast individuals because of their worth and dignity as bearers of rights, 
including, as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has it, the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion and belief. And when we think of radical assertions of conscience, again, as we've discussed uh, uh, thus far quite extensively, we, of course, can't help but think of Martin Luther uh, and his great, here I stand, I can do no other. Uh, and we also think of other remarkable uh, statements by Martin Luther. One thinks of his statement in his On Secular Authority, a text that already came up earlier today, in which he says, every man is responsible for his own faith, and he must see to it that he believes rightly. As little as another man can go to hell or heaven for me, so little can he believe or disbelieve for me. On the other hand, these scholars have all written, in effect, that the intellectual ground for radical assertions about conscience uh, really were prepared much long before, much before Martin Luther. Uh, that, the, that the ground was prepared, as it were, in the common Western and Eastern patristic traditions. And one dares to say in scholasticism, uh, even though Martin Luther would probably have wanted to disown any, any dependence on a scholastic uh, background. So here's my, here's my question uh, for uh, you all. In your various writings, who are some of the most important pre-Lutheran reformers, we could say, pre-Lutheran uh, asserters of a here I stand, I can do no other uh, right uh, to freedom, uh, to dignity, to conscience, uh, that you have studied closely as having had a major impact? I want to start with you first, Kyle, and then we'll ask uh, Elizabeth and David the same question. So, Kyle Harper. All right, thanks. Well, I'm. I'm delighted to be here and honored to be a part of these conversations and to join this panel. And uh, I'm glad to hear that, that Gregory of Nyssa has already came up. Uh, he, he's an important figure in this in the way I would reckon, reckon with it. But uh, who is he? I think that, that matters. He's a fourth century father, and to the extent that he's, he's known in the Western tradition, uh, he's probably most famous as a Trinitarian theologian. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he's a Trinitarian theologian of such significance because he lives in the, in the first uh, post-Nicene uh, generation. He lives after Constantine. And that's a very important moment uh, in which the church is rapidly becoming uh, a majoritarian institution. Christianity is becoming a culture. Uh, it's becoming mainstream. It's not a, a persecuted minority any longer. And in some ways, it doesn't have the... Uh, luxury, if you could call it that, of um, standing aside and not thinking through uh, how it wants to grapple with some of the more uh, challenging, uh, some of the greater evils in the world, like slavery and, and poverty and uh, other, other forms of institutions that, that uh, cause human suffering. And Gregory lives at an important moment. He's an ecclesiastical leader uh, in the church at the moment when it is assuming a new level of social responsibility than it's ever had. And so uh, while I think it's important, and I like the fact that you use the word genealogy, uh, to recognize that there, he's drawing on ideas that are even older. He's drawing on uh, the Genesis account of the creation and the idea that all humans are created in the image of God. Uh, he's, of course, drawing on the gospel and the love commands. Uh, but it's in his moment, the way that he translates those both into action and into uh, social principles that matters. And so the, the church in that phase of its existence, when for the first time it's becoming something other than a, a minority institution, uh, does reckon with uh, the, the evils of the world in a way that is new and creative. And even if, if the ideas that it's deploying uh, have a, an even more ancient history, that's a particularly important moment. So I was glad that, um, that he came up. And the other uh, contribution I might make to answer the question as you've posed it uh, does look even earlier to the, to the early church. And as you were talking, in some ways I uh, was thinking that we might imagine as the, the real ancestor of here I stand uh, to be Stephen uh, in, the, in the book of Acts and the importance of martyrdom as an experience in the early church uh, the, the willingness to, to sacrifice uh, any kind of good in this material life um, for, a, for a different, other, and transcendent kind of good uh, is, is a form of freedom, is a, is a kind of conscience uh, that, that is developed quite uniquely uh, in many ways in the, in the early Christian experience and is really integral to the, to the development of this culture, even in the period before uh, Gregory of Nyssa. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. May I ask just a quick follow-up? Sure. 
you've written about the way in which early Christian thinkers such as Justin Martyr mm -hmm. really in, a, in effect constructed a new understanding of freedom of the will. Mm -hmm. Could you connect that with the, kind of the way Gregory of Nyssa argues against slavery and maybe just say just a little bit about uh, how Gregory argues against, against slavery for those who are not familiar with what Gregory argues. Sure, uh, so two separate questions there. One is that I, I think it's just possible if you're tracing the genealogy of ideas and you're interested in the, the specific, the articulate development of an idea of the free will that it would require you to have a deep appreciation for the contribution of Stoicism and I think uh, Stoic philosophy is a, an important part of the conversation in the ancient world. But at the same time, I think there is something, something very distinctive, uh, at least by the second century, as Christianity is very much coming into conversation with ancient philosophical schools, Stoicism in particular, uh, that uh, contributes to a, a new, uh, a novel, creative notion of the freedom of the will. And Justin Martyr, um, simply in, in kind of philological terms, is uh, the, the earliest instance of the, the usage of that construction of the free will, something that's internal, uh, a, a kind of faculty uh, that, that causes our dispositions that somehow doesn't have any other kind of form of necessity or cause imposed mm -hmm. upon it. And that's a really radical moment. And it takes a step further even from people like Epictetus who are in the, in the same conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that that notion is novel. And uh, there is clearly, a, a, I think, a pretty direct line from the development of that notion, um, certainly by the middle of the second century in Orthodox Christianity, to the, to the Nicene and, and post-Nicene fathers like Gregory, like Basil of Caesarea, who are very familiar with those texts, with that language, with those ideas. Uh, and are now looking out across a, a city where they have a, a level of social leadership that maybe the previous generations didn't. Uh, and they have those ideas in their head, they have them in their texts, but they're looking out uh, at, at congregations of Christians, at, at cities of people, uh, and trying to think through what does it mean to, to say that people have a free will if they're enslaved? Uh, what does it mean for their agency? What does it mean uh, for their ability to make morally significant choices like uh, what one does with, with one's body? Uh, and so there's a, a, a kind of a direct line uh, from the articulation of that idea of this internal faculty that, that has to be um, free from constraint and its, its importance in the, the social context that Gregory's looking at where he, he is taking a leap to say those people uh, or, or in an um, institution, they're in a, a circumstance where uh, that, that will is, is being endangered by um, circumstances that are inherently unjust and, mm -hmm. and intrinsically wrong and um, is, is really creative in doing so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now we've already talked about key figures, Gregory of Nyssa, Basil of Caesarea, Cappadocian fathers who are crucial for the foundations of Orthodox theology, Elizabeth. And you've given us a wonderful contribution in Christianity and Freedom that focuses on the contributions of Orthodox, distinctively Orthodox, uh, Eastern thought and practice to notions of dignity and freedom. Uh, who, are, who are some of the heroes in that, in that story, uh, if I may put it that way, Elizabeth? Thank you. And also, I echo the sentiments of everyone here. Thank you for the invitation to be with you. Um, <clears throat> I would, again, uh, I would have started with Gregory, but. Uh, I think someone else who's extremely important, and I think um, Basil, Basil's sermons and Chrysostom's sermons, would that we had those kinds of sermons today in, in all of our churches. Um, I think their sermons on poverty are particularly instructive mm -hmm. um, because what they do is they connect ideas about freedom of conscience um, and also the demand to act on behalf of um, principles of freedom to different kinds of enslavement, and in particular, the enslavement that comes from from impoverishment. Um, so we get a broader sense of ideas about what freedom or lack of freedom means. Um, we get a broader sense from them about what Christians are called to do in order to remedy and correct um, social inequality and social inequity. And we also get from them um, some of the foundational ideas that led to the creation of institutions in what was the Christian East that we associate well, that we know today, which are things like the university, uh, which uh, were premised on 
uh, the, uh, studying the universe of ideas in order to understand the way in which Christian ideas um, engaged with those and could contribute to those when it came to um, fun the fundamentals of freedom. Um, also the Christian hospital and all that went along with hospitals and um, things that we talk about today, shelters, uh, the equivalent of soup kitchens, homes for the indigent. Um, these were all institutional consequences of uh, Basil and Chrysostom's problem problematizing about different forms that limit um, human freedom um, and that demand a, a response from believing Christians. And then finally, someone else who I think who, um, deserves emphasis is uh, Athanasius, the Patriarch of, uh, of Alexandria, who um, you know, twice deposed, twice returns, but ultimately is understood as the yes. architect of the Nicene Creed and um, the, the radical understanding, the ontological understanding of, of freedom that lies at the heart of the Nicene Creed. So I think all of these are uh, important figures. And I think it's worth pointing out, and this came out certainly in the earlier panel, but that you know, the chance to kind of reflect on Luther um, is also a chance to kind of reflect on um, how we use terms like church and Christian. Um, and the kind of standardized um, tropes that have come to be associated what, with Luther's impact on the church. Um, and it's a geography of Christianity and a geography of the church that largely omits the Christians of the East and Christians in the East. And I think recovering um, the fullness of that Christian geography is absolutely central to how we understand the overall uh, mm -hmm. contributions of Christianity, not simply historically, but also in the present. Um, I just returned from a conference on um, religious pluralism and peaceful uh, coexistence in the Middle East that was held in Athens. And it was uh, interesting to hear the ecumenical patriarchs' uh, reflections on the importance of pluralism and that ultimately pluralism itself and acceptance of pluralism um, is based on the, um, the primacy of place of, of freedom in, in Christian theology and certainly in Orthodox theology. So I mentioned that not only for us to broaden our geography, when we talk about church, the church, Christians and Christianity, um, to uh, move beyond a more kind of truncated one, but also to recognize that some of the thinkers that we were talking about earlier um, the contributions they make didn't stop um, at the, uh, at the four, in the 15th century, yeah. um, and that there's a, a kind of modern problematic that um, has continued drawing from that wellspring. I'm so glad you mentioned Athanasius. Uh, if there is someone who said, here I stand, uh, literally contra mundum, it was <laughs> Athanasius. Right. And we don't perhaps reflect often enough that part of his stand was also a stand for a kind of political theology right. that said the freedom of the church has to be inviolable, right. that the temporal authority doesn't have the right to define core Christian right. doctrine uh, to take over the church. Uh, and that battle kept being fought by uh, successors of Athanasius against even the Emperor Justinian. Right. Uh, so there's an extremely ortho important orthodox contribution. Uh, yeah, there, and I think, there. again, I think um, Athanasius is, is important for that because unfortunately, in, you know, still very large shadow of Edward Gibbons and his yes. almost cartoonified <laughs> version of, uh, of yeah, yeah. Um, yes. you know, how it is that orthodox yes. think and yes. you know, This affects whether, the way we view Tertullian as well, yeah, by the yeah, way. Exactly. Gibbon, Gibbon doesn't have a very flattering yeah. portrait of Tertullian either. Yeah, yeah. right, exactly. <laughs> so uh, I think, you know, people like Athanasius and others who came after him, you know, reinforce the, what we heard earlier again this morning, the recognition that um, in, or, the, in order to have, uh, be Christian and have a Christian society or society that's religiously plural that ultimately demands a kind of a, a freedom and independence and autonomy from the state that, you know, whether it's um, Eusebius or, or Gibbon, uh, Gibbons, they've both, you know, done a lot of damage to, to how we think about that historically in the orthodox space. Thank you, Elizabeth. David uh, Lantigua, uh, your, your outstanding work on Bartolome de las Casas, including in the Christianity and Freedom volume, has already been teed up to a certain extent by our earlier uh, conversation. You don't have to restrict yourself to talking about de las Casas, mm -hmm. uh, but, but perhaps you could talk about other figures as well. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, what, what, are, what are some of the key uh, heroes of conscience, as it were, you've looked at? Sure, yeah, well, as Kyle said, I mean, it's, we have to pay attention to the particular moment <clears throat> in which these ideas are presenting themselves and, and these practices um, are, are being demonstrated uh, by the specific Christians that are considered in, in the volume. Um, the period I look at is contemporaneous with Luther. Um, 
Luther doesn't come out of a vacuum, right? This is the, the, the Reformation is in the context of Renaissance throughout Europe, the rise of humanism, uh, a return to the classical tradition, uh, to scripture, the sources, the church fathers. Um, and, and so reform is taking place across all of Europe, uh, even in a place that doesn't seem to be uh, one of reform, and that's uh, Catholic Spain. Uh, we heard the term Spanish Inquisition used earlier, right? Uh, the Reconquista, uh, the colonization of the Americas. I mean, whenever we hear these terms, they're immediately kind of sound for us, you know, the, the, the epitome of, of a repressive society, right? A persecuting society. Um, and, and so what I find so fascinating about this period with respect to Spain is, is that you have a debate about you know, the proper way of, of being Christian and what it truly means to be a Christian. And so when we look to the colonization of the Americas, you have in a very clear uh, debate uh, that takes place uh, between two opposing views of the proper way to evangelize uh, native peoples. Uh, and that's really what I'm, I'm drawn to in my research. Um, and it was presented earlier by the human rights practitioner, the question she raised last panel about what are the justifications that are used in order to advance these kinds of you know, destructive uh, patterns of, of behavior and, and the dispossession of peoples and, and uh, the, the you know, destruction of cultures. Um, and so you know, just a few years before you know, the, the Luther and Wittenberg in 1517, you have you know, the, the first uh, Dominicans uh, who arrive uh, to, to the Americas. Um, and they, they come to the island of Hispaniola, um, if, if I'm to point to a particular moment uh, where this sort of all begins to develop. Um, and, and what they see is utterly shocking to them. I mean, they were told by, you know, Columbus's diet, you know, the, the, the reports coming back from Columbus and, and other uh, travelers that, you know, this, this place was just, you know, so, you know, fruitful in terms of its, its, uh, the people, the land, everything, and yet they get to Hispaniola already in 1510 and it's falling apart. Disease has settled in. The, the forced labor system that's in place there is, is just decimating the population. Um, so how do they respond as Christians to that brutal reality? And, and one of the things I like to point out is that they're religious. So they've taken a vow of poverty. Uh, and that already puts them in a position to see things, I would say, from a unique perspective than those who surround them, um, who are very much interested in, in uh, you know, profit and, and commerce and, and uh, you know, and so forth. So the, the, what happens in, in 1510, 1511 is this uh, concerted effort on the part of these first Dominicans to uh, to challenge the, the, the practices that are happening around them on the island of Hispaniola, which is today, of course, uh, Haiti and Dominican Republic. Um, and so uh, they, they choose among their, their best preachers uh, a figure by the name of Anton Montesino, who gets up before uh, you know, a church uh, congregation uh, and, and, uh, during Advent of 1511. And he preaches to them that um, they're in mortal sin. And uh, he's now taken upon himself. It's, it's actually, he's preaching on, on John the Baptist as a voice crying out in the wilderness. And so he uses that language to say, I'm a voice crying out in the desert of this island. Uh, you are all in mortal sin. And uh, so you know, uh, immediately he's going to get uh, a reaction to that, uh, and and um, you know the the Dominicans rather than saying you know here I stand it's it's here we stand as a religious community in response to this uh, to this violence um, and and so they raise the question you know um, are these not human beings do they not have rational souls are you not to love them as you love yourselves you know very basic Christian. Uh, claims being now presented to, to the congregation. Um, and so this really kind of leads to a, a ver, you know, a, just an amazing set of, of responses on the island and, and within the, 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 uh, the colonial project itself of Spain, uh, all the way up to the, to the, uh, the royal courts. Um, you know, and, and so you know, figures like 
Bartolome de las Casas have to be understood in that context so that they're not seen strictly as kind of like a lone voice because they're part of a, of a, of a community, you know, a period again in which if we look to Luther, right? Luther was an Augustinian friar, right? So he, he's, the, the, the Augustinians were very much shaped by the mendicant orders. So that, that sense of mendicant, you know, preaching of the gospel, the true gospel, which is at the heart of, of mendicant communities, um, is, is very much uh, you know, happening at this point in, in time. Um, and Spain is an, a unique case uh, in so much as you have a royal patronage system in place, whereby the Spanish crown has really a great deal of administrative uh, function over the church. So the church is in very much in a compromised position by its own will. The popes you know, wanted this <laughs> for various reasons. Um, and, and so, you know, that's, we have the Catholic king and queen of Spain, you know, who, who have this kind of, of uh, res, you know, responsibility over, over church matters um, in a way that puts, we might say, secular clergy in a much more compromised position and therefore highlights why these mendicant orders are as important as they are for, for uh, preaching the true gospel, which, you know, according to the Dominicans, cannot be presented in a way that does violence to the hearer of the word. And so, um, you know, the, the, the freedom of the gospel must, uh, it demands, it requires the freedom of those who would hear it. Uh, it can't be imposed on them. So, so it very much becomes a debate about, as I mentioned before, the proper way to, to evangelize and whether or not coercion, which has deep roots in the Christian tradition, that doesn't just come out of the the, the Crusades, although the Crusades are, are certainly part of that discussion, but canon lawyers in the Middle Ages were using justifications for using coercion, uh, you know, various uh, sorts uh, as a way of compelling uh, both pagans and even Jews uh, in the tradition. Um, and then it goes back to Augustine, you know, and of course the, the controversy surrounding the, the, uh, the Donatists and the heresy in the early church. Um, so. Uh, so all of that, you know, the, the, again, this is a, a much larger thing than these first Dominicans, as we see in the case of Las Casas, who's, you know, himself is a, is a priest slaveholder. And so when he's denied absolution in the confessional by a Dominican, well, he starts to reconsider, you know, his, his actions. Um, and so that ends up weighing on him over the course of his life, and he ends up joining the Dominican order later. Um, but, uh, but it also finds connections at the School of Salamanca, as you mentioned, the University of Salamanca, which was kind of the center of intellectual life in Spain at the time, um, you know, among figures like Francisco Vittoria, who comes out first uh, on his uh, lecture on the Indies in 1539, which becomes a very important uh, document and in, in subsequent reflection on the roots of international law, um, very important for Hugo Grotius. Um, you know, uh, who, as someone connecting the image of God with the language of rights. And that's something that I find very, uh, you know, unique to this point in time, is that connection between, uh, you know, theology and law in that, in that way. Um. Thank you, David. Uh, Slavitz, uh, I want to turn to, to you. Uh, we had a long discussion earlier today about voluntarism and religion. And you've long challenged uh, some stan standard assumptions about voluntaristic versus collectivistic religion. We, we no doubt have a sort of uh, assumed reflex that uh, voluntarism is good, collectivism is bad. Uh, and in a sense, part of the purpose of our discussion, our project here is to challenge these received ideas. So I'd like you to just comment. How does, how does focusing on these kinds of pre-modern contributions of, in fact, collectivistic religious communities to understanding freedom and dignity give us uh, perhaps a better genealogy, also a richer normative uh, vision, uh, and any other thoughts you'd like to offer? Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I wasn't a contributor to the volume, but I started reading it, or both volumes actually, and uh, I very much, I find it extremely illuminating in many ways. Um, let me first explain how I think of collectivistic Christianities, uh, because to me they don't only signify something that's pre-modern. In fact, in yeah. fact, I think they problematize the narrative of the separation between modern, traditional, and, and, and modern societies. When I speak of collectivistic Christianities, I refer primarily to European collectivistic Christianities, the kinds of Christianities we find uh, 
in societies like Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, Croatia. Mm -hmm. So not just Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which is uh, uh, sometimes a trap that people fall into, but also Catholicism mm -hmm. uh, as a tradition. And um, these Christianities, I think, are uh, uh, unique religious phenomena in Europe. They're often forgotten. They're not explored as much as they should be explored. Uh, and they're unique because they're culturally specific. They're historically embedded. And what I always emphasize um, in any sort of uh, conversation about collectivistic Christianity is they are constitutive of particular group boundaries. Uh, so the, the key aspect is not a level of church attendance. It's not a question of one's belief that is constitutive of it. But the key component is, in fact, uh, belonging to a specific group. Um, so even when this belonging is without believing, it's very different than in Western Christianities. Um, uh, th this uh, belonging is always public, it's always very communal, and because of this communal aspect, public nature of these Christianities, they're actually more similar, similar to um, European Muslim communities mm -hmm. than they would be to, say, Spanish Christians or Italian Christians or even Irish Christians. Um, so, as I said, I think that collectivistic Christianities, in the way I approach them, um, complicate this idea that there is a strict separation between tradition and modernity. Um, and I think they help us see modernity in terms of multiple narratives of modernity. Your, the notion of multiple modernities indicates there is no clear cut between what was traditional and what's modern. Uh, it's also a, a notion that I think helps us understand that modernity doesn't mean establishment of just universal uh, uh, identities uh, that replace particular identities. It's not uh, a promotion of or advancement of just voluntary associations or religions as uh, institutionalized or uh, expressed in form of uh, voluntary associations. Uh, modernities also mean um, sort of revival and perpetuation of particular identities. I think it's really important to understand that. And um, I don't think that there are uh, Christianities that are going to go away. I think they are constitutive of religious pluralism, contrary to what my late teacher, uh, Peter Berger, would say. <laughs> I, I actually engage his work on this uh, very much, and I find it extremely uh, insightful. But uh, I recently conducted um, an ethnographic study of everyday life of uh, Catholic women in an urban parish on the Croatian coast, the beautiful Dalmatian coast. And uh, I was interested in the ways in which they themselves uh, um, approach their religious experience, their religious fate. So I asked them questions about the, 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 uh, the language they use, uh, when they talk about their religious identity, is it something that's ascribed? Is it something that's chosen? Is it neither? Is it both? Uh, I was also interested in the ways in which they think of their religious activities, daily prayer, for example, attendance, uh, uh, mass attendance. Is that something that is just part of their daily routine? Or is it a space of creativity? Is it a space of resistance, in fact, to daily routine that they have as, as, uh, as mothers, as wives, as professional women? And what I, find, what I found in this study is that the, the nature of their religious experience, daily routine that they have, is in fact very complicated. Uh, that on the one hand, they speak about respect for tradition and respect for uh, uh, church authority. Um, but on the other hand, they think of their religious experience as a, a process of conversion, which is a process of conversion they see uh, as a sort of uh, reappropriating tradition that was given to them. So, so they think of their tradition as something they were born into, but also something that they appropriated in a different, in a uh -huh. different manner. Uh -huh. um, Saba Mahmoud, who is an anthropologist of, uh, of yes. uh, secularism, yes. but also religion, yes. I think helps to understand this way of thinking about religious agency uh, as uh, not something uh, that uh, assumes resistant to norms and resistant tradition, but the way in which uh, uh, we can think about uh, inhabiting tradition. Um, I think she's correct. I completely agree that the notion of inhabiting helps us here. Uh, but I think inhabiting is complicated for the questions of religious agency. It can, uh, it can um, indicate uh, assent to tradition and norms, but it can also indicate resistance uh, or dissent from uh, uh, these norms and tradition. Um, the most important point I think I want to, to sort of underline is that I think that collectivistic forms of religiosity uh, question uh, 
um, understanding that modernity means movement towards more individualized uh, religious experience. I think individualized religious experiences combined with collectivistic forms of religiosity in very complicated way. And, and it requires from us to really explore in a more expansive way uh, the notion of freedom, what it means to be free, what it means to be religious in a pluralistic world that, that we have today. And freedom is, is not, it can't be reduced to just opposing tradition That's or right. opposing community. In right. fact, the yeah. women you talked with are yeah. able to inhabit community, receive tradition, but in a way that isn't, isn't necessarily disempowering right. or right. Uh, stifling. They can engage it critically. Uh, they engage it critically, uh, they engage it critically, but also, as I said, uh, I was wondering to what extent this is a space of creativity for them or space of, of sort of establishing different kinds of norms. And in, in carving out the space for doing, uh, uh, attending mass daily, for participating in religious uh, community, the smaller religious prayer groups, they actually had to uh, remove themselves from their family lives. So oftentimes they have to justify that to their uh, husbands to their children, and, and they have to resist in some way. So it's, I think it's a, uh, it's a problematic that can be captured simply just by talking about individualist forms of religion. It is a respect for tradition, but also in a little bit different way. Mm -hmm. I have two questions, follow-up questions in a way, and then, and then we'll, we'll turn to the panel. One is many of us, whether we were uh, uh, trained as historians of political thought or historians of theology, uh, historians of um, intellectual life in the West, we have res certain received narratives. Uh, when I was being educated uh, or miseducated in the history of political thought, uh, there were kind of two narratives. There was a kind of Straussian narrative, and there was a kind of Rawlsian narrative. Uh, the Straussian narrative uh, and the Rawlsian narrative actually converged, though, around a kind of shared notion that, well, freedom uh, essentially arose uh, with modernity. Uh, the pre-modern world was all about virtue. Uh, it was all about collectivism uh, in, a, in a kind of uh, you know, bad uh, sense. Uh, how do the insights you've offered cause us to rethink the kind of genealogy, the pro proper genealogy of freedom uh, in the West. Uh, the book uh, by Larry Seedentop, Inventing the Individual, uh, offers a kind of re-narration of this history, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. We also have new narratives by Samuel Moyne about the genealogy of human rights, uh, which offers a sort of different perspective, uh, argues in, effect, in fact that human rights really doesn't originate with modernity, it, it, it arrives very, very late uh, on the scene, only in the mid 20th century. Uh, so how does your work complicate and challenge these received narratives? And a second question after we've discussed that is, how does your work give us resources for answering a question we dealt with earlier, namely, what are the theological resources that we should recover for emphasizing uh, the ways in which all people are bearers of rights of conscience and, and freedom of religion? All the figures you've studied in, in, in fact touch on this actually, uh, maybe even touch on the idea that there are inalienable rights to certain kinds of freedom regardless of, of one's religious background. But first, the first question on genealogies. Uh, David, could, could I start with you on sure. genealogies? You've, done, you, you've written important right. articles which yeah. sort of suggest how your work challenges standard genealogies of human rights and freedom right. and religious freedom. To what extent was Hegel correct, right? The, yeah, the, yes, yes. <laughs> the, the modern world, uh, you know, revolves around subjective freedom. Yes, and Luther. Um, it goes back to Luther. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, although he, at least for Hegel, he certainly, and Luther included, they would attribute Christianity, obviously, as having a central role in that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I, I, you know, understanding as much, although I'm not, you know, trained in political thought, I've had to, to address it in the context of my own work, I mean, but... Um, and coming to know Strauss's narrative, you know, that, that move from, from you know, uh, pre-modern natural right to modern natural rights in the plural, you know, in this, uh, uh, or even, you know, uh, Rawls for that matter. I mean, what these narratives do is they focus on the domestic political context. Mm. So they focus on mm. questions of the rise of, of the nation state. Um, and, and that's obviously going to have a very European focus. Um, and, and so when we talk about the history of political thought, the, the dominant narrative is one in which, you know, it's post-Westphalia, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, it's, it's post-Reformation. 
um, and and uh, you know post royal absolutism, you know all of this in in Europe. Um, a lot of of uh, I think research, you know, within the last couple decades, uh, or increasingly more research in the last few decades. Um, has been turning to this question of global history, you know, and and uh, you see this in uh, you know not just the history of political thought, but also in international law. The the you know the turn to the international uh, colonial context, in particular, an imperial context. So rethinking liberalism and the rise of liberalism, without forgetting you know liberal empires, um, and and so um, in a way, I see my research as as responding to that more recent shift in, in how we think about political thought. Um, and, and one of the things that the sort of the dominant narrative still effectively, I think, does, uh, although this has been questioned, is you know, the, the, to what extent do, do debates about you know, religious diversity factor into the kind of the role, you know, the, the rise of the nation state or the rise of the modern state you know, as a means of pacifying religious conflict, um, which is very, compelling argument. Um, but I would say that in the context of, of the colonization of the Americas, there is something similar operative there. You know, there's a debate about whether or not you can wage war on the basis of difference of religion. Can you wage war in order to punish uh, idolaters for their inhuman practices, right? So, uh, which is, uh, you know, these are practices that are very closely wedded to religious, you know, religious traditions and customs. So. Um, so I would say that you know you have some some interesting overlap there with these two different ways of thinking about uh, the history of political thought. Um, but again, that turn to kind of international uh, and and uh, colonial history, you know, it, it also helps us to sort of rethink our 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 canon of who our political theorists are. Yeah. People like Locke, right? Locke looks a, a bit different. His state of nature looks a bit different when you're really focusing on him saying, in the beginning, all the world was America. You know, um, and, and what, what the state of nature has, that civil society ends up you know, understanding better, which is the right to private property. So that sort of, you know, I don't know, it just provides a different sort of angle on, on these uh, traditional Kyle, maybe questions. we can turn to you, Kyle. You have a chapter in the volume called No Constantine, No Kant. Uh, which is kind of a, a frontal attack on standard <laughs> genealogies of human dignity. So uh, what, what are your thoughts about what a, what a proper retelling of the sources of human dignity would, would emphasize? Well, I, I think that uh, people mean all sorts of different things when they talk about rights, uh, even yeah. when they're talking about human rights. Mm -hmm. And if, if what we're interested in is the concept of human rights, which is politicized as a kind of set of international norms in the middle of the 20th century in a particularly powerful way at a particularly powerful uh, moment uh, after a particularly traumatic set of experiences globally, then, uh, then we're going to find one genealogy. If we're looking for other definitions of rights um, in other contexts, then you would find a different genealogy. But if we're interested in um, global norms of human rights, uh, then I do think that the, the bedrock of that, uh, of that set of norms is the idea of human dignity and the, the belief in the high inherent worthiness of all humans regardless of their uh, ethnic identity or other um, circumstances. And that particular norm, of, as you alluded to, um, is sometimes claimed for kind of enlightenment rationalism. and. Um, there's certainly a case to be made that, that you can find um, the roots of it, um, certainly traces of it in, say, uh, Kant. But the, the argument that I make in the, in the chapter and that um, I would stick to uh, is that this genealogy is much more ancient and that uh, it, it should affect how we view the Enlightenment. Um, in some sense, the Enlightenment is the um, secularization of certain norms that um, I think are maybe not um, so easily um, derived from a neutral uh, universe. Um, and I think it's understandable and, and um, better than the alternatives if people want to say that those are um, neutral and, and universal norms. But the, this is where the genealogy matters and getting, getting the um, history right matters. 
um, that the secularization of those norms and the Enlightenment rests on a kind of even deeper um, bedrock. And uh, to understand that is to understand a, a legacy that's um, several thousand years old and that may have multiple sources, but um, one of which certainly, and I think arguably the most important of which is um, the, the concept of the worthiness of the human being that flows out of a particular vision of um, the idea that humans are um, creatures uh, with the, that bear the image of God um, and that they are they're worthy of, of love regardless of their uh, ethnicity or their status uh, or their gender uh, or otherwise. And so um, Kant's project and other Enlightenment projects may be to provide a kind of universal um, set of axioms that, that justify those norms. Uh, but at least historically, I think we can say that those norms arise out of particular traditions and particular ideas um, and particular places. Thank you. Elizabeth, how would you? Uh, sure. Uh, you, you, we've already heard a little bit of discussion about the importance of geography to genealogy. And this is something you've, you've written a great deal about. We forget the, uh, the, the East uh, and its uh, cultural, intellectual geography. Perhaps we need to tell a, a genealogy that also takes geography into account. Yeah, I, I would also emphasize language um, because in terms of your question, you know, can we sort of unpack and deconstruct the claim that it's really the, the Reformation that gives us, um, you know, the foundations for contemporary human rights law and in particular the focus on the dignity of the individual. Um, I think um, the term individual itself feeds into this kind of artificial distinction between modern and traditional, um, where modern things are what we associate with um, the prioritization of freedom and traditional and collective are things that are associated with the repression of uh, the dignity of the person. Um, so I think, you know, I wanted to have this wonderful quote um, that I wanted to read from uh, John Zizulis, who, mm. um, well-known Orthodox theologian, part of the Catholic Orthodox uh, dialogue. Um, he writes, you know, God did not provide the law in order to take freedom away from man but precisely to give freedom uh, to him. And he says, freedom is the law. Freedom is the law. Um, and you know, clearly, Zizulis yeah. is drawing on um, you know, Eastern thinkers, um, you know, Greek, Syriac, and others, um, in making this kind of an argument. Uh, but I think Zizulis is also important for us because his entire anthropology of personhood, which looks at the dignity of uh, each and every person created in the image of God, and then develops a, an ecclesiology that um, is meant to help people transform themselves from the image to the likeness doesn't use the term individual. It uses the term person. And I think you know, this is a, a critical linguistic difference. And it's a critical, I would say, you know, orthodox contribution to the way in which we can develop a more um, you know, fulsome genealogy of how Christianity contributes to contemporary arguments about freedom and the law. Um, so that, that's one thing I would mention. The other thing I would say is that if we go back to Byzantine times and we think about, um, you know, again, as wellsprings for arguments about freedom and the law, um, the ultimate sort of violation of personal freedom, of course, is violence and war. And it's very interesting to note that there is no just war tradition, there is no holy war tradition um, in Eastern Christian theology. There are enormous treatises developed, military treatises developed during the uh, Byzantine period, uh, Amoricius, for example, um, that talk about uh, that are informed by this theological notion that war is a, is a tragedy, and it's the tragedy of the post-Lapsarian condition. It's the reality of the post-Lapsarian condition, but never can the notion of virtue or holiness be applied to um, the conduct of war. And in fact, the best that we can do is to um, uh, Center the meta noetic tradition, the um, you know uh, metania, re, uh, repentance, repentance, repentance yeah. um, in all practices that are associated by the necessity of this fallen condition. Um, so there were you know long problematics on freedom and unfreedom and war as the absolute negation of freedom that predate certainly 
some of the things we were talking about here and what the you know, economists write, might write about Luther and the Reformation. And then finally, on the, collect, uh, on the language again, and going back to collectivist traditions, I think another way that we can think about collective, um, collectivist religious um, <clears throat> communities and experiences is to think about this as a problematic of ecclesiology and ecclesiastical structure. Um, because what a lot of these, you know, collective traditions do is they have, they're embedded in the notion of ecclesiology as um, divine human communion. Um, and that ecclesiology uh, assumes then that it's within the context of the liturgical experience that one's freedom in be is becoming through participation. Uh, and I think that, um, so introducing sort of ecclesiology and then the ecclesiastical structure that goes along with some of these traditions helps us break out of these kind of, you know, um, ultimately unhelpful binaries that um, we associate. And just to footnote, the late, great Yaroslav Pelikan, um, who I think is somebody who, you know, embodied what we're all talking about here and who at the end of his life formally embraced orthodoxy, had this wonderful statement, you know, tradition is the living faith of the dead and traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. So here again, I think precision of language is something that um, we must use. And I, you know, bring out my pelican when I'm arguing with <laughs> traditionalistic um, orthodox uh, that, you know, and, get them to drop yeah, off that mystic part. That's beautiful. Yes, and, and Slava, say your thoughts. Just a couple of comments to what Elizabeth was yes. talking about. Um, uh, I think that you were talking about the distinction between individual and person, and I think that's really critical. Um, I am, I'm, I guess, the most modern person on this panel in the sense of what I study, and uh, in a personalist theology of somebody like uh, John Paul II or mm -hmm. Jacques, Jacques Maritain, mm -hmm. I think makes this distinction so clear to precisely show the extent to which somebody's personhood is shaped by belonging to a community. And I think that's really yeah. important, theologically, anthropologically, in every other way. Um, and as far as the question of collectivistic traditions is concerned, I, I am not, uh, I think that what you are mentioning, uh, what you are highlighting as a way to think about it, in terms of ecclesiology, I think is very helpful. But I think it's also important to keep in mind the ways in which Christianity becomes part of culture, how it infuses culture how it actually be, is being transmitted historically in what ways, and how it becomes particularized. Because if we lose sight of that, I think we'll not understand both the advantages of Christianity affirming notions of freedom, but also the problems of that. Thank you. Um, yeah. And just one final comment. You were yeah. asking us about how to complicate the narratives. And one of the narratives you mentioned in the question you asked was not just Rawlsian and Straussian. You also talked about Foucauldian yes, narrative. Yes, yes, I'm glad. You and know. I think, uh, yeah, Foucault and, I, and Assadian and so yeah. on. Yeah. And I want to introduce Foucauldian narrative because I think it, it touches a little bit on one of the questions in the previous panel, which was what's the place of secular non-believers in, in this conversation. And I, I was really happy to hear that question because I think it requires for us, to, first of all, to problematize the notion of secularism, not to think of it only as a political phenomenon, but to think of secularism also as a moral orientation. Um, uh, and what I mean by this is in the Foucauldian tradition, critics of secularism, they want on the one hand to, uh, to, the, to unmask the modern notion of secular agency. That's how they talk about it, right? They want to complicate this whole narrative of this advancement towards greater freedom, individual freedom. But on the other hand, what they do, they actually reassert these boundaries because they talk about secular agency as something that is norm-resistant, tradition-resistant, uh, history-making, and opposed to suffering, right? And they talk about religious agency as something that is affirmative of tradition, affirmative of norms, and also affirmative of, of suffering and sacrifice. But it, again, if you look at concrete examples as to how these types of agency are actually embodied and how they're enacted, and I study social movements, you see that it's really complicated. So somebody like Josef Tischner, Polish philosopher and also advisor of uh, uh, chaplain and advisor of solidarity movement, which helped uh, bring uh, 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 the fall of communism in Polish context, but in Europe as well. He thinks of uh, solidarity as a way to liberate human beings from suffering that is superfluous. It's a suffering that one human being uh, uh, imposes another. And then in the context of anti-apartheid movement, there is a communist uh, activist uh, and a leader of African National Congress, Chris Honey, 
who talks about suffering is needed. So he spent years in prison because of his anti-apartheid uh, uh, activities. And he thinks of sacrifice as necessary if we want to reach liberty. So what I'm, what I'm trying to do with this is to actually complicate these ideas of what secular agency means. Priest who is affirming uh, liberation from suffering and then secular atheist communist activist who is talking about in fact, uh, uh, suffering in order to reach freedom. Not to, not to basically say there are no differences, because I'm really against hybridizing these kinds of categories, but to think of complicating narrative in the sense of thinking about it in a very historically nuanced, contextualized way that will not um, allow us to succumb to preconceived notions of what freedom means. Mm -hmm. I want to briefly uh, touch on the second question that I raised, namely, what are the resources from the figures, the movements that you've looked at that we can bring to bear to defending the human dignity and religious freedom of all people, of the, of the other, if you will, the religious other or perhaps the ethnic uh, other, the cultural other? This is a crucial question to ask today because we're well aware uh, that in the United States and other countries, there are efforts to recruit Christianity uh, to justify increasingly narrow, exclusivistic forms of ethnic nationalism. Uh, this is a trend across the Western world. Uh, so what are resources, uh, theological resources, to bring to bear for the human dignity of all people? Uh, David, you mentioned liberal empire. Uh, and the, the, the crucial importance of justifying, defending the human dignity of all people made me think of, uh, of a statement Edmund Burke made, who was, of course, a great critic of liberal empire. And when he was asked to justify why on earth he was wasting his political capital defending Indians uh, who were of no importance uh, in terms of their uh, dignity, he said this remarkable uh, thing. I have no party in this business, but among a set of people who have none of your lilies and roses in their faces, but who are among the image, who are the images of the great pattern as well as you and I. I know what I am doing, whether the white people like it or not. Uh, David Bromwich of Yale says that those lines were among the most amazing lines any human being has ever said in history. And it's interesting that Burke refers to the images of the great pattern. Uh, as well as you and I. He's clearly drawing on the first chapter of Genesis, uh, um, made in the image and, and likeness of, of God. Any reflections you have about what are the, the bedrock resources? You mentioned the phrase bedrock, Kyle. Sure. Uh, David, you've written about this as well. Remarkable that Dominicans defended pagan Amerindians and their right to religious freedom, even their right to defend themselves with violence if necessary, to defend their religious freedom. And using Roman legal sources, yeah. actually, which is very yeah. interesting. Um, in, in one instance, Cicero, uh, the writings of Cicero to defend, uh, you know, in the context of the Roman Empire, you know, uh, the, that, uh, you know, the conquered peoples have a right to defend their ancient customs and their traditions. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, again, this is a period of Renaissance, so, you know, sources from, uh, unlikely places. Um, the, I, I think the image of God, the Imago Dei doctrine, is, is, is as central then as it is now. I mean, it was clearly central in the civil rights work of someone like Dr. King, um, and it just continues to remain a powerful source of inspiration for recognizing um, this, uh, this shared humanity. Um, but as, as Elizabeth was also rightly pointing out, I mean, there, it's it's not just a, you know, uh, an argument for you know, sameness, we might say. Uh, there's also that question of becoming like God that's important for uh, these religious figures. You know? So growing in virtue rather than recognizing just basic rights. Um, but you know, the scholastic categories that the figures I work on are, are, are using, I mean, the, the, the imago dei is directly associated with, with human powers of reasoning and freedom. Uh, so, you know, that uh, can go a long way in defending, you know, the rationality of the people you're engaging if you really do believe they're made in the image and likeness of God. Um, and so, you know, that, that has quite a bit of purchase in their mm -hmm. arguments um, to say we're not just, 
you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, uh, communities, peoples that have, uh, that, are, that are rational, they have rational agency as a, as a people, uh, and, and they, uh, they have freedom as well, freedom in political, economic, as well as uh, spiritual. And De Los Casas and others invoke these, uh, these biblical arguments against more Aristotelian styles of argument that defended natural slavery. Strictly Aristotelian, yeah, Strictly yeah. Aristotelian. Right, right, yeah. 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 Um, which is an important way of nuancing the diversity of scholasticism mm -hmm. uh, in that period. Other thoughts on theological resources for a defense of universal I just wanted, yeah, I just wanted that's briefly that's, yeah. to comment on the ways in which collectivistic traditions, Christianities are usually understood as a problem because yeah. of the way in which they oppress the others or are exclusivistic in their claims. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to say that in my work on, on these traditions, what I've, or in different historic expressions of them, what I found out is that due to the ethical components of the notions like human dignity, personhood, uh, some, in some cases, in very particular historical context, these collectivistic traditions, in fact, enabled uh, uh, an expansion uh, of, of, uh, uh, of the notions like national identity, for example, mm -hmm. to include the others, to be, more, uh, to be more tolerant of others. And uh, I find them to be as much useful for uh, sort of uh, uh, offering a critique and subversion of exclusivist nationalisms, ethnic nationalisms, as much as they can be supportive of it. depends okay. on the context, and depends actually how they're articulated. Yeah, fascinating. So. Well, let's turn to the, uh, the, the audience. We have uh, 20, 25 minutes or so uh, of uh, time for uh, Q&A. So uh, yes, yes. Uh, Andrew, Ambassador Andrew Bennett, uh, wonderful that you're here, and uh, yes. Thanks, Tim. Um, I wanted to pick up on a very brief mention that, that Kyle Harper made about uh, Stephen, the proto-martyr, sort of mm. highlighting him as one of the first to, in the Christian traditions, say, say here I stand. Um, and talk a little bit about martyrdom in the Christian tradition, particularly if we look at uh, the Orthodox tradition, the Eastern tradition, the experience of living out conscience and uh, an expression of freedom of conscience, particularly mm. during the 450-odd years of the Turkokratia, of the experience under Soviet communism, where martyrdom uh, and also confessors of the faith taking a very radical approach to that freedom of conscience, where martyrdom comes to be the most radical expression of that freedom. And to pick up a little bit on your point, Tim, now when we see the situation in a number of our countries, Canada, the United States, um, where we are thinking again about what does freedom of conscience mean uh, for Christians, for people in other communities? What can this experience, and this, to use Tim's term, this genealogy of witnesses um, around freedom of conscience say to us today? Because increasingly, I think a lot of people, particularly Christians, are looking at um, the challenges facing them today in terms of expressing their conscience and living up to what they're called to do through their faith. Um, martyrdom seems to sort of exist as this golden thread running through Christian history. And I wanted you to just maybe make a comment on the idea of martyrdom, whether it's red martyrdom or whether it's some form of white martyrdom where Christians are called to um, express their freedom of conscience in a fairly radical way in the midst of, of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Anyone like to take that very... I'll Profound, start. challenging question, yes. Yeah, I'll start. Um, again, having come just last night from this conference on religious pluralism and, and reconciliation in the Middle East, uh, which brought, you know, again, faith communities uh, uh, across and with diversity across communities and within communities to that conference. Um, this issue, I think, um, you know, the, the word pluralism was very much part of that conference. And I think what you raised, Tim, um, in terms of the American context today is coming to terms with and learning how to uh, respect the dignity of the human person in conditions of ever greater degrees of um, pluralism of belief and non-belief. And um, you know, there's something uh, I think a little unsettling about us being able to easily have this con con conversation here, particularly as it relates to Christianity when Christians are literally being eradicated in the, the lands where Christianity originated. And I think it's very important for um, the ability for us to do well in the United States 
to um, be able to speak truthfully about um, empirical facts on the ground. And if in the United States we're experiencing yet the latest um, episode in uh, our country's um, lack of comf comfortability with religious pluralism, um, you know, if you were a Protestant in the 19th century, I mean, you know, for men, uh, uh, Roman Catholic, you are for many Protestants, you know, the child of the Antichrist, okay? If you are an Orthodox in the late 19th, early 20th century, you know, you're part of those, you know, uh, people who the Immigration and Exclusion Acts were designed to keep out. If you're a Muslim today, then you, you are experiencing the same sorts of feelings of discrimination and oftentimes violence. So, And I say that because I think it's important for us to historicize what we're experiencing today in the United States to recognize that it's this issue of coming to terms with pluralism that continues to challenge um, how we protect the dignity of the human person. And as that's happening here, I think it's absolutely crucial we recognize that you know, the, the depluralization and the homogenization of religious communities in the lands where Christianity originate um, continues even mm -hmm. as we speak. Yes. And it's a particularly acute problem for Eastern and um, Oriental Orthodox, but it's for all Christians of the East. And it's an equally acute problem that's horizontal pluralism that's being eradicated, so modern martyrdom. Um, but it's a vertical um, you know, effort to vertically, within communities, homogenize. And I think you know, where issues of Christian-Muslim dialogue come into play, it's important to um, recognize that you know, the kinds of depluralization and homogenization that are visited on others are also visited on others within. Um, so, centering the way in which we accept and create legal regulations to um, ensure pluralism um, and, and freedom of belief and conscience, I think, is we need to connect what's happening here with what's happening in other places and certainly where Christianity is concerned to see um, you know, that um, the, the modern uh, martyrdom experience. Elizabeth was a part of a project called Under Caesar's Sword, which my friend uh, and colleague Dan Philpott and I uh, worked on together, which documents how much red martyrdom there is today, of course. Uh, you mentioned earlier, Andrew, that today is the Feast of Saints Cosmos and Damien in the Greek Catholic uh, liturgical calendar. Um, Kyle, do you have any thoughts about what ancient traditions of martyrdom might have to say? about our current situation? Sure, and you called it a golden thread, and I think um, one of the reasons that it's a golden thread is that by its very nature, martyrdom has always been paradoxical. Um, in Tertullian's words, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Uh, it's, it's an act of sacrifice. You're right to also to evoke the spectrum of different kinds of sacrifices that people might make as, as witnesses, but it's, uh, from its very beginnings, it's paradoxical because it's, in some ways, the most, uh, it's the supreme renunciation of power. Um, and for the early church, um, represented the um, submission to the violence of the most powerful political entity that had ever existed. And um, yet at the same time, the paradox is that it's a, it's a way of speaking. Um, it's a, a very powerful um, way of speaking. And there's, there's, it speaks to something um, deep in our humanity when people um, are willing to sacrifice. And um, I think that's as true today as it was 2,000 years ago. Other, other questions? Uh, yes. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I just heard a comment. Um, I think it was from you about, about the, the Enlightenment being a secularizing force. Um, I'd like the audience to, if the, does the audience realize that there were two men who were Freemasons, they both resigned from the Freemasons because of the French Revolution? The two men were George Washington and Demeist. Now this is the Demeist who championed the papacy and it was obsessed with bloodletting. I'm, uh, the Enlightenment was far more Christian, 70 to 80% of the Enlightenment was far more Christian than either its enemies or its champions wished to admit. And um, I'd like to recommend my Great teacher John Pocock, founder of the Cambridge School, his six-volume biography of Edward Gibbon on his rise and fall of the uh, Roman Empire shows that Gibbon was not the great enemy of Christianity that he was made out to be. 
Think about that. Any, any thoughts on, on that? Uh, I've, read part, I've read some of Barbarism and Religion by Pocock. Uh, any other thoughts on the comment there? Well, I, I like Pocock because he reminds <laughs> us that um, you know, Christianity originated in Asia and then was disseminated to Europe. And so, again, a real kind of call to think about the dissemination and globalization of Christianity. Um, and again, recovering this, you know, thinking about and now the north-south um, you know, dissemination of Christianity. And so I think he uh, you know, is very useful in having us think about the way in which transnational belief systems um, are, are indeed globalized. But I confess you're not going to get me to say a good thing about Gibbons today. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say something about Gibbons. Yeah. Any, any, any um, scholar of the fall of the Roman Empire whose work's being talked about 240 years later has done it's something. Done something. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I'll, I'll, I'll just say I would probably accept a little bit of your pushback, um, but probably not as much as you would like. It's a reasonable question how um, secularizing the Enlightenment is, and it's a period in which I'm not an expert. Um, I think, to, to my taste and limited knowledge, some people um, push very far in that direction. Um, Jonathan Israel's um, mm -hmm. work in the last decade yeah. um, is, is certainly trying to do that and um, does, it, does it in, um, you know, in a powerful way. I don't, don't agree with all of it. But um, at the same time, I um, have always um, uh, been persuaded by Charles Taylor and I don't think we can talk about whether or not the Enlightenment's secularizing or not simply by thinking about the um, kind of religious identity cards that um, particular yeah. philosophers are carrying around. But um, I'll leave it at that. And certainly there are many Enlightenments, as scholars have emphasized recently. We've talked about many Reformations yeah. in the course of the day. There clearly were many, many different Enlightenments. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, I think that this question actually invites us to be very cautious about the way we use the notion of secularization and secular and that we have to give it a thick account just much, as much as we give a thick account of what religion is. Uh, so even Charles Taylor, I think, simplifies the versions of humanism. He talks about exclusive humanism and uh, uh, secular humanism as anti-religious. And I just find that very sort of, uh, it, it's reductionist reading of what secular humanism can be, uh, especially in contemporary context in which secularity can be embodied in many, many ways. So. Any uh, further comments or questions? Yes, uh, yes. You probably already addressed this issue, but I just wanted to hear more about the difference between globalist, Western-oriented concept of religious freedom and human rights and localized, contextualized, dynamic understanding of religious freedom and freedom of conscience, especially within the context of state religions and state churches. This is probably a question of individual versus communitarian approach, but I just wanted to hear more about that. Thank you. Any, anyone want to take that up? Uh, maybe Slava, your best best yeah, place I, to do that. I, I mean, you. you I can yeah, only yeah, just perhaps yeah. touch on this a little bit. I was a little bit uncomfortable in the first panel when uh, everything that had to do with question of, of uh, religious freedom as a right uh, was linked to individual conscience. Yeah. And and yeah. the reason is very simple. It's historical. Mm -hmm. When we think of the communist experiences, and I'm sure that we can find similar uh, context in contemporary world. When you think of communist experiences, it's that they in the context of former Yugoslavia, for example, they did affirm the right uh, to individual freedom for religion, but it was very privatized. So it mapped really nicely on a particular liberal notion of what religious freedom is. Uh, while at the same time, collective uh, uh, right, uh, uh, religious right was something that was denied. It was not just marginalized, it was oppressed. So I think your question is very important, and I think in the roots of human rights, and there are people here probably who know more about this than I do, uh, the, the, the relationship between individual uh, protection of collective right, uh, protection of individual right, is very much uh, something we need to probe even more. Mm -hmm. yeah. Though I think we did, in the course of the discussion, I think throughout the day, try to sort of emphasize that it's wrong to kind of volunteerize conscience right. too much or right. individualize it. Right. Uh, that conscience of persons, right. not individuals, is always embedded in tradition and, and community, community to some extent. Yeah. Uh, so I think that might be one way to, to, to respond. I think it's the burden of uh, our project here, our conference, our volumes, to, to try to de-link uh, religious freedom from a strictly sort of secularized right. or individualized notion yeah. uh, of the human person. Uh, there certainly are attempts, uh, and Kyle referenced them, to ground human rights in Kantian notions of autonomy. Uh, 
uh, and we can wish them well. Uh, no reason to uh, uh, oppose anybody who wants to you know, genuinely defend uh, the human dignity and the human rights of all people. Uh, but we, uh, speaking collectivistically, uh, we, we might wonder whether there are not other uh, sources and foundations as well, uh, which root freedom of religion in a thicker understanding of the human person uh, as, again, embedded in tradition uh, and uh, community. And also keeping in mind what was said earlier that uh, Matt Frank emphasized, that conscience is also compulsion. This is not about choosing life plans uh, right. so much as responding to duties to the truth, uh, a sense of uh, obligation. Uh, duties that, that non-believers can also feel very, very powerfully. Uh, uh, it isn't just uh, for conventional religious believers who have a sense of a duty uh, to, to the truth or a duty to seek uh, some harmony with what, whatever wider source of ultimate reality there may be. <clears throat> this is not restricted to traditional uh, religious believers. Any, any further thoughts on that or uh, uh, further questions? Yes, 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 thank you. Well, actually, forgive me, I, uh, Sue Taylor, had, who you, you, had, you asked wonderful questions earlier, and I would like to hear from you as well, but I want to have Sue Taylor uh, join in since we haven't heard from you, Sue. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, Sue Taylor from the National Affairs Office of the Church of Scientology. Just a very quick question. We've been talking about freedom of conscience, um, like in the Western world and this sort of thing, and I was just wondering, um, going back before Christ, um, were there any ancient, ancient thinkers, ancient um, spiritual thinkers that uh, could have influenced um, the more modern thinking with regards to freedom of conscience? That's a wonderful, wonderful question. Uh, any, uh, and any responses? Certainly, uh, much of what we've said would suggest that the, the deepest roots of some of these ideas are in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and it's also worth pointing out that a number of uh, early Christian thinkers were inspired by the battle uh, for freedom of religion that the uh, Maccabeans uh, fought for in the Maccabean revolt uh, for the early Christians. First and second Maccabees was, of course, part of the Christian Bible. Uh, and the story of revolt uh, against the Hellenization that was coercively imposed on the Jews was a story that inspired early Christians. That, of course, is pre-Christian. Uh, but but uh, other 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 ideas? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, that's your question. I've <laughs> yes, mentioned yes. briefly stoicism, stoicism yeah. and yeah. I think that's um, certainly one of the kind of richest veins that we might look to as a as a source in the classical world and the Western world for non-Christian and pre-Christian ideas that, um, that are conducive to um, thinking of, of humans as, as inherently worthy beings. And you see, you see um, traces of this in ideas of cosmopolitanism, the very word, you know, I'm a citizen of the cosmos, not uh, my primary identity isn't this sort of eth ethnic or uh, civic identity that, that limits my duties to, to the people who are simply in my kind of near circle, but um, as a citizen of the, the world, I have uh, responsibilities to all people. Um, that I think there's a, certainly a progressive moment in that in, um, in the ancient philosophical schools and Stoicism in particular. You see Cicero dancing around with it, um, talking about um, dignitas, um, that, that sense of worthiness um, of people who have uh, reason. Uh, and so I think there, there are, there's a case to be made for some uh, of the ancient philosophical schools, particularly Stoicism, having uh, a, a kind of uh, impetus towards looking at, at humans across any kind of civic or ethnic boundaries and as inherently um, moral and therefore um, worthy creatures. Yes. Um, thank you for the fascinating and insightful comments on this panel. Um, Sam Moyne's name was invoked yeah. earlier, and I think it's in the last utopia that Moyne kind of gestures to um, ideas like the ones that we're sharing here today as a quixotic search for deep roots of human rights, which, as you mentioned, he sees as a, um, a very um, yeah. modern, recent project. And I know there's a lot of debate around Moyne's work, but one of the points he makes is around gender. And so I guess the question is with the, the sources and the thinkers that we've been talking about here in this panel that we've heard about just now, um, are, the, are those sources speaking to human dignity across gender, 
explicitly or do you take them to be implicitly? Or if not, what are your thoughts on kind of when in Christian thought those ideas of human dignity expand to be inclusive across yeah. gender, if not across yeah. sexuality? Yeah. And thinking about this problem, particularly <laughs> in a contemporary context where the idea of <clears throat> equal human dignity yielding equal human rights is still very much contested um, among American Christians and, and transnationally as well. Thank you. Maybe this is a question with which you might begin, Kyle. You've written a book on sexuality in the ancient world and transformations that Christians helped to bring there. This is partly a matter of uh, rights of dignity of mm -hmm. both men and women. And I live to tell about it, and I'm never going to do it again. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, <laughs> um, Sorry to bring the, it up. Uh, <laughs> I, I repent. Um, the, uh, it's, you weren't treading on any controversial issues no, there at all. No. So, yeah. um, I, yes and no, uh, in reference to the, the ancient Christian sources. And um, there, I think it depends on um, again, what genealogy we're looking for. There are certainly um, strong elements of, of uh, what we would think of as progress towards gender uh, equality in ancient Christianity. It's in Galatians that there isn't male or female um, in Christ. And that's a radical thing. Uh, Paul's um, letter to the Corinthians where he talks about uh, marriage uh, expects a level of kind of mutual fidelity between husband and wife in the marriage relationship that's um, completely alien to uh, ancient culture. Uh, and those are really important sources of, uh, of ideas of um, um, worthiness, of dignity of women in the ancient world. And um, that continues, I think, right through late antiquity. And um, I've tried to write about the, the importance of um, Christian ideas uh, in, in practice, for, uh, particularly for enslaved peoples, but, but above all for enslaved women, and how, um, what, what radical implications the gospel carried for people uh, who were, uh, in, in a sense, subjected both to um, slavery and to uh, norms that came out of a very patriarchal world. Um, at the same time, there's no doubt that um, ancient Christianity and late ancient Christianity had um, ideas of gender norms that are um, very different from most modern um, ideologies and that um, would fit, I think, uneasily in, in terms of contemporary secular um, gender norms. And, uh, and there are elements of late ancient Christianity that still, um, that still do certainly um, envision uh, men having more power within the family, within the city, um, than women. So um, I think what you ask is a really hard question and a really good one. It does make me think that we heard earlier from Robert Wilkin about the Franciscan nuns saying, here we stand. Uh, so we did have a remarkable instance of, uh, of women in a patriarchal context asserting their equal rights to freedom of, uh, of, of religion. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, I'm afraid we have to conclude. We could go on and on. Uh, we have a short break before we begin our next panel on contemporary Christian contributions, uh, which will be moderated by my co-editor and friend, Alan Hertzke, uh, starting at 2.45. And please join me in uh, thanking this wonderful panel. <laughs> <laughs>